If you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word, we are going to be in Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, we'll read verses 32 through 43. Um, we're going to continue in our series, and uh, it's, it's um, neat to see how we're, it's going to be able to even apply to a Mother's Day message this morning. So it's going to be, be great. Here we go. <clears throat> now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her they laid her in an upper room since Lydda was near Joppa the disciples hearing that Peter was there sent two men to him urging him please come to us without delay so Peter rose and went with them and when he arrived they took him to the upper room and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them but Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body he said Tabitha Arise, and she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this morning that we have an opportunity, Lord, to hear from your word. And Lord, as we see these two, Uh, miraculous events, uh, that it would just draw us to worship you and exalt you, Lord, that you are the God above all gods. And so, Father, we pray that you would um, help us to leave here uh, to magnify your name and to see your greatness and your power. Help us to be different as we leave here. Lord, help me to preach plain and clear. I do understand the judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth, and I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we come to this section in Acts, we kind of move back to Peter. We were focused on Paul. Now we're back to Peter. We'll be with Peter for a, for a few weeks. And then the emphasis will go back to Paul as well. And so Peter is ministering. He's, he's in, in an area. And there is a man that we're told that's been paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. So for eight years, he has known nothing about his normal way of living, the way he used to live, and he is bedridden, cannot move, cannot get up, having to have people care for him, take care of him, and uh, and he is helpless. And Peter's coming by. Now, when we go through the book of Acts, we see that there are miraculous things that happen. And as I've been saying from the beginning, as we see through the book of Acts, when we see miracles, when we see miraculous healings, when we see these extraordinary, these extraordinary things happen, there's always a purpose for those, and it's always followed by people coming to know the Lord. And so we're going to see this in these two instances. And, uh, and I would say that, that miracles are rare. You know, they, 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 they don't often happen. That's why they're called a miracle. You know, if they happened all the time, they wouldn't be uh, a miracle. And, uh, and, and God is using the apostles to do some extraordinary things. Why? So that the kingdom of God might increase, multiply, and grow. We're going to see these two encounters are real similar to two situations that Jesus himself had when he was ministering in his earthly ministry. And uh, and we we, we know of of a time when there was four friends that cared about their friends so much that, uh, that they carried him on his pallet And they went to a house that Jesus was teaching in, dug a hole through the roof, lowered the man down through the roof. (laughs) And Jesus, it says, when he saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven you. Take up your mat and walk and go. And, uh, and of course, the, the, the religious, the Pharisees, they get upset because who can forgive sins but God? And so we will notice here that Peter... He doesn't forgive these, this man's sin, but he's going to heal him. And how is he going to heal him? In the name of Jesus. 
We have not the authority to forgive people's sins or to even raise uh, and, and bring healing to anybody, but the power of Jesus has both the power to forgive sins and to heal and deliver. Amen? Aren't you glad that we have a, a, a God who can save, deliver, set free from the power of sin and the consequences of sin and bring us to wholeness? That's what Jesus said he came to do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to preach release to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted. And so that's what Jesus is, is doing. And now he's doing it through the apostles. And he comes to this man, and uh, he's bedridden, and, and he says, in Aeneas, he says, Jesus Christ heals you. He heals you. Now, rise up and make your bed. Now, how many moms have made that statement to their son? Get up, make your bed. <laughs> uh, uh, we, have, we have here uh, an instance of, of healing restoration. Restoration. Now, many of you, um, we pray, will we'll never experience uh, a physical ailment like this man. Uh, I pray that none of us enter a state where we're paralyzed for, for eight years or even longer. But, but there's many people, and maybe you fall in this category, that you're paralyzed through different emotions. That maybe fear paralyzes you. Or you're paralyzed by, by pride or bitterness or anger. And there's a stronghold on your life that has caused you, in essence, to be ineffective. And, and there's many times in life that we go through depression, anxiety, worry, stress. And we can be paralyzed and live our lives even though we are walking in this world we might as well be bedfast because we are stuck in a state that our mind doesn't let us live. And the title this morning, this message is this, Rise Up, Rise Up. We're going to hear these words. We heard these words to this man, Rise Up, Arise, Make Your Bed. We're going to hear it to Tabitha, arise. And Jesus is saying to us this morning, we need to, to rise up. We need to allow the, the whole healing power of God that works through us through salvation, that the Holy Spirit comes to live and reside in us, to give us a spirit of hope and not fear, that we are accepted and loved by God. Romans tells us there, there is therefore now no more condemnation in Christ, that you are a child of God, you've been loved by God, that if God has saved you and redeemed you and brought you into his kingdom, then you are his beloved child of God. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has his hand upon you. The Holy Spirit preserves you. The Holy Spirit keeps you. The Holy Spirit encourages you. The Holy Spirit's there to empower you. No more living in fear and anxiety, worry, depression, addiction. Rise up. Walk in the freedom that Jesus has provided for you. Walk in his victory and live. Make up your bed. Don't go back to those same old places that keeps you from being dependent on everyone else. Why does he tell him to make up his bed? You know? Just rise up. You think, rise up. Now get out of here and go, have, and go, and go do some things. He says, make up your bed. This guy has not been able to make his bed in eight years. He's had to have other people do for him for eight years. He has been dependent on others for eight years. For eight years, they've had, he's had to be picked up and had uh, sheets changed for him. And Peter says, rise up. Make up your bed and go, why because no longer are you going to be tied to that bed any longer. There are some things that we tie ourselves down to. 
that cripples us. But in Christ, we have been set free from two things from sin. From the penalty of sin, which is death. And from the power of sin. You realize that? Because of the victory that we have had, that we have in Jesus Christ, we have been set free from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death and hell. We have been set free from that. We are assured heaven through salvation. Amen. That ought to give you a reason to say amen. Amen. How many of y'all glad you're going to heaven? Okay. Makes me wonder. You've been set free from the, pow- from the penalty of sin, but also, guess what? We have been set free from the power of sin, that sin does not have to have mastery over us. Now that we are a Christian, we are no longer slaves to sin, but the Bible says that we are to be slaves unto righteousness, that we have the best master. He is our master. We are slaves of Jesus. He's our master. He sets us free. We take upon his yoke because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So this morning I would ask some of you, what, what are some things that are, that are paralyzing you? What are some things that have trapped you to a bed and I would say in Jesus rise up he heals you he sets you free amen well so he heals this man and word gets out word gets out because we have another instance of a lady Uh, now in Joppa there was a, a, a lady her name is Tabitha that's her Aramaic name her Greek name is Dorcas uh, I don't know if I'd like to be called by the Greek name, do you? Um, so we'll, we'll go with Tabitha. And, uh, and Tabitha means gazelle. It means gazelle. And this lady, she was one of those women that just blessed everybody. So mothers, if you want, if you want to be a, a blessing and you want to be a mother that honors the Lord, right here is an example of a lady uh, that did that. What, what was it about this lady that was so special? Look at verse 36. Now, she was full of what? Good works and acts of charity. She was full of good works and acts of charity. This was a lady that was just overflowing with the love of Jesus in her heart. She was full of it was there there of, of good things, goodness, kindness, helping the poor. Helping those that were in need, especially to the widows. She had a heart for the widows, and she cared for them and loved them and, and, and showed great love to them. And she was, she was so full. I mean, she was a lady that, that not only just talked about her faith, she put action to her faith. Amen? She, she did more than just study the Bible. She did more than just read the scripture. She actually applied it to her life and she actually blessed other people. She was full of good works and full of charity and full of good deeds. Now I know a lot of people it's full of a lot of stuff. But it's not necessarily very, very good, right? But this, this lady, she was full of good works. We, um, we look at Paul... And I don't have this on the screen. I'm just going to read some things to you. Just, just, uh, just listen. Um, but in Titus chapter 2, it's, he says, Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. Then he says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach... What is good? And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husband. Those are some good works, some good deeds. Those are character qualities of a godly woman those are things that that make a lady worthy of honor 
in, in, in Timothy, he talks about women that, uh, he says, women should adorn themselves in respect, respectable apparel with modesty, self-control, not with braided hair, gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. You know, you know what the heart of this is that Paul's teaching there in Titus and in Timothy? He's saying what makes a woman beautiful is not what she looks like on the outside. Not the fancy jewelry or the fancy clothes or the nice shoes. But her heart, her character, her modesty, her love for God and her love for people. That's what is attractive. That's what God loves to see. Women who love him with their whole heart, who live a life of faithfulness and godliness, live a life with with modesty. We could learn some things from all of this, couldn't we, in our culture where where we have generations of just... uh, of just putting things out right there and, and just being vulgar and, and brass and just the behaviors that we see that oftentimes are very unbecoming. And so this lady Tabitha, I can picture her being, she's called a disciple. And she's a woman who, who's living out her faith and walking out her faith. And I thank God for the godly women in Living Water Church who do just that. We have a, a lot of Tabithas in this church. We have a, we have a lot of women who, who, who love God and serve God and follow God and, and, and want to honor him. And you model that. And she was a, a lady who, who did that and, and how a blessing that is because you see as we grow our lives ought to be one that wants to honor who the lord use our life benefit someone else other than yourself impact other people this lady made an impact a positive impact in her community why Because she was a disciple of Jesus, she loved him, and it affected the way that she lived, and she poured her life out into helping other people. She had a heart for other people. I wonder where she got that teaching from. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment there is? If you can summarize the Old Testament in a sentence, Jesus, what would that be? Of all the laws that we have, what's the greatest? And Jesus didn't even flinch. It was so easy. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. I'll go ahead and tell you that the one that's runner-up. And love your neighbor as yourself. She loved people. How are you investing in other people's lives? What kind of impact are you making in those around you? Who are the people that God burdens for you to minister to? Now, everyone doesn't have to have a burden to minister to the widows. Not everyone has to have a burden to minister to the poor. Some have a burden to minister to children, the elderly, the poor. there's, There's multiple ways that your life can be poured out and used. But the question is, are you allowing your life to be used to be a blessing for others? Because this lady made such an impact that upon her death, they honored her, they washed her, they had her placed in this upper room, and, and there was many, there was, there was some widows that were there that are weeping. Because when you lose someone that you love, when you lose someone that brought purpose and, and blessing to you, you, you miss them, don't you? And some... For some, today is a very difficult day because their mother is not not with them. She's gone on. Like Tabitha, she passed away. And so for some, this day is, is very difficult. And these ladies are weeping and they're crying. They call for Peter 
because they hear Peter's close by, and we know that Peter, that God's using him to do mighty miracles, and, and we know that Jesus can do all things, so they're hoping maybe, maybe God can do a miracle, and so they call for Peter, and Peter comes, and it says, all the widows, this is in verse 39, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that she had made, that Dorcas had made while she was with them, and I could just see them just going to Peter and letting Peter know and just talking to him about how great of a woman that she was and how awesome she was and how much she loved them and how she cared for them and watched over them. And look at the clothes. These are some of the clothes that she made us. Some of them are, are like, like, like t-shirts. They're the undergarments and then the outer garments. She, she made clothes for the widows. They were they, they needed extra assistance and help. And this was a lady that loved them and, and cared for them. And, and how, where did she get this love? I don't know. Maybe she was a disciple. Maybe she learned about Jesus through Philip. Who Philip was one of the seven. And one of the purposes of the seven, that when they were called to, to be on a leadership team, was what? To care for the widows. And she was ministering to them and, and she loved them and she cared for them and she provided for them and, and, and they are weeping because they, they lost this lady who meant so much to them. You know, when I was reading this, I, this came to my mind. You know, why is it that sometimes that, that the people who really are serving God and, man, God's using to do many things, why would God allow them to die? You know, why her? Why Tabitha? I mean, she is living a life that's just sold out to helping other women in need. I mean, why her? You ever, you ever think that? You know, I mean, they had so much going for them. There was, they loved the Lord. Why did why does God allow them to die? I think of Chris and Doreen Wurzel. They were here just this past Wednesday, and they helped us they were, uh, build the church on Grassy Lick, and, and they helped us build these walls in here too. And they were missionaries, and they gave 20, 20 years of their life just building churches for churches who couldn't afford to build churches. Well, they had a son. He was in the ministry, and he was a vibrant pastor and a youth pastor. And man, as a church that was doing well, growing, I mean, he was just doing mighty things, preaching, going to preach one night uh, at a youth service. And he had his notes and he had his sermon and all worked out. And the, the passage he was going to preach on that day was, God works all things for the good who love him and are called according to his purpose. 30 years old, before he ever steps and gets to preach that sermon, he dies of a massive heart attack. It's like, why? Why him? Lord, why would you let somebody that's a soldier... For you, die. I mean, there's all kinds of sorry people out there that you could have let go. I mean, I'm just being real with how I, how I think sometimes, right? I mean, there's a lot of people out there. There's some murderers, child pedophiles. I mean, there's a bunch of people that could have died instead of this woman. Why you go take her out? I think of my aunt who... Uh, she passed away last year and just loved the Lord, served in the church, worked, gave of herself, raised her children to love the Lord, had grandchildren. She loved them, and she just poured her life into serving Jesus and loving her family. And she gets word that she gets cancer, and within three months, she's now with the Lord. And you think, why? Why her? Here's the reality. In life, things don't always work out the way that we think they should. And people that we love die. People that we care about pass on. People that matter to us sometimes are taken from us. Our lives, every single one of us, we're breathing right now. It's a gift from God. We don't know how many days we have left. They say, according to my age bracket, I'm midlife. Well, maybe. I hope so. 
But here's the thing, we don't know when our life ends. So how do we know that we're in our midlife? We may be in the fourth quarter with a minute left to go and we don't know it. Right? So what do we do? As long as we have breath in our lungs, we need to praise the Lord. As long as we have health, we need to serve him. As long as we have the ability to think, breathe, speak, help, bless, we need to allow God to use us for his glory. We need to be a blessing for those around us. Amen? We all need to be like Tabitha. She made such an impact on people's lives for the glory of God. Here's the good news in this story. God did answer a miraculous prayer. And Peter tells him, I need you all to leave the room. And he kneels down and he prays. And he says, Tabitha, arise. Rise up. Tabitha, God's not finished with you. Jesus, when he was healing Jairus' daughter, there was only, there's only five instances in the New Testament where someone is brought back to life. This is not resurrection, it's resuscitation, because all these five that are revived will die once again. There was one, Jairus' daughter, and when Jesus went, Mark tells us that he used an Aramaic expression, Talithi kumi, means little girl, rise. Tabitha kumi. There's only one consonant difference between those two words, between Tabitha and Talitha. Jesus, once again, through Peter, brought this woman back to life. And what was the result? Many people there turned to the Lord. What's one of the purposes of that miracle? Was not just to bring honor and glory to Tabitha, but to bring honor and glory to who? The power of Jesus. Our life, when we spend it and we lay it all out, we have one life to give. One life to give. And the question is this, will we rise up and live it for the glory of God? And when we die, hopefully we'll have people there that we've impacted and and lives that we've touched and people that we've invested in. And and I I pray that we will be people that have made an impact for the kingdom of God so that that if if somebody's coming to our funeral, they're they're saddened, but yet they know that that where we are, so there's some joy. How many of y'all realize there's a difference between a Christian funeral and someone who's not a Christian? There is joy in sorrow, because we know that even those that we have lost, that we love so dearly, even though they may not have been physically brought back to life for us to enjoy, the moment that a believer breathes their last breath, they hear the words from the Lord Jesus, arise, and they enter into glory with the Father forever and ever and ever. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope and peace. Amen? So I know that people like Troy, that's Chris and Doreen's son, he's dancing in the presence of God and singing praises to his name. I know people like Nancy, she is now celebrating and worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And some of you all have loved ones that right now, because of the truth of who Jesus is and the power of salvation and the power of the gospel, you know they are in the presence of God singing with the angels. And it brings us great joy. Amen? Great 
great peace. Because one day, Jesus is coming back. And there's going to be a resurrection from the dead. How many of y'all realize that? Our bodies will be reunited. And he'll say once again, rise up. And the dead in Christ will rise. And we will be reunited with him. There we will forever be in the presence of God forever. Amen. So let me ask you this question. Are you living your life for the glory of God and the good of others? Hmm? Are you investing your life in the kingdom? Are you making an impact everywhere you go? Are you showing the love of Jesus by loving other people? Are you full of good works and acts of charity and kindness? Not that our goodness and kindness saves us. Only the grace of God saves us. But boy, when he saves us and he puts the love of Jesus in our heart, it can't help but overflow. It should show. Amen? If you, do, if you don't produce any fruit, that's a sign you've never been saved. So our lives ought to reflect the goodness and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank